Good evening and welcome to Tea Time. Welcome to Tea Time. I'm so glad you're joining me tonight. It is a March 25th. It's the end of the month already. I'm going to talk about my weekend and get to my guests because, you know, my 55 minutes goes real quick. Friday, I was here. Beautiful Paradise Studios. I ended up here for karaoke and open mic, and we had a great time here. So if you're not doing anything on a Friday night, come on down at 7 o'clock. Saturday, I did Murdered by the Mob in Manhattan at the Iron Bar in the city. You haven't seen it yet? It's like going to an Italian wedding. Someone gets whacked. You got to figure it out. You sing, you dance, you eat, you drink. It's so much fun. Just go to murderedbythemob.com to look up all our upcoming shows, and I hope to see you there. Sunday, yesterday, I was in Jersey for the Garden State Film Festival for the movie Jersey Bread. That's B-R-E-D. And I have some pics with that that I was with some friends who were in the movie and there to support. So what's the first pick we've got up there? We've got, there's Gino Caffarelli. Um, he did the movie Cruise. There's Ed Shin. He is the official uh, film festival photographer all over the place. Uh, and then we have Chris Mormondo, who's in Gravesend. Everyone loves Charlie and Jersey Bread. So uh, look for that. And then there's um, Lorenzo... Lorenzo Antonucci. Oh, I got to get that right. Um, also, amazing. Everyone did a great job. It's Greg Russo's movie. There's my best friend over there, Joe D'Onofrio. Um, also an amazing actor. So I just want to thank everyone for supporting. And shout out to Greg Russo. Wrote it, directed it, produced it. And it was really, really, really good. We had a great time. And then we had an after party. So listen, I'm excited because I met this man a while ago. Gave me his book, and it took me a while to read because it was giving me agita, and I get, had to keep putting it down, putting it down, putting it down, and I had a really hard time getting through it. But an amazing, amazing, amazing read. He's an actor. He's a producer. He's an author. Randy Jurgensen is here. Hi, Randy. Hi. <laughs> Finally got you here. Thank you. <laughs> How you doing? Fine. Good, Fine. good, good. All right, so I want everyone to get to know you and, and about your amazing career and the different turns and twists that it's taken throughout the years. Okay. You know, you grew up in Harlem. Harlem, yeah. Harlem, Harlem. West Harlem. West Harlem. And you really never left because no. you end up living there, working there, and doing everything there. Yes. Right? Yes. And, um, go ahead. So, <laughs> Don't be um, shy. Got to talk. So, <laughs> before we start, uh, yeah. first of all, thank you for having me oh, on the show. Welcome. I'd like to give a, a shout out to a few of my friends. Sure. You know, <clears throat> Joe Cirillo and Joe Mazzilli and Joe, uh, Donnie, Donnie Brasco Pistone. Uh -huh. And especially to uh, uh, Father Chris uh, uh, from my... Uh, Italian parish, mm -hmm. uh, Our Lady of Pompeii. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was born in I was born in uh, 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 West Harlem. I was born uh, two blocks south of 125th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, and I was born at home because there was some kind of a measles or mumps outbreak at the hospital that my mom went to. Wow. So they sent her home, and I was born at home. And uh, my parents, uh, my parents were superintendents of the building. And for 19 years of my life growing up, uh, my parents were superintendents. In fact, uh, my brother and myself running in the streets, uh, the people would say, oh, we know you, you're the Rafferty boys, or we know you, you're the Smith boys, or we know you, you're the Supers kids. So mm -hmm. 
we were we were the supers kids. Um, I think it's important uh, 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 to share with you uh, the times that that I that I grew grew up in. Um, in in my neighborhood, uh, in my neighborhood, you know, there were a couple of bars. There was a a, a tailor shop, a, a grocery store, a meat market. A lot of uh, mom and pop stores. Oh back yes, then. yes, and uh, <clears throat> and there was the bookmaker, and there was the man who took the sports bets, and there was the man who took the numbers bets, mm -hmm. and you know, we we also knew that there was a lady of the evening of where she she lived over, mm -hmm. so. I knew that neighborhood inside and out, and in fact, I I knew at a very young age uh, some of the people's uh, uh, business, in that the rents were twenty eight dollars a month, to, uh, wow. Teresa, wow. and you know, being superintendents, we collected the rents, yeah. and every now and then there'd be a knock on the door that they couldn't make the twenty eight the, the twenty eight dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <clears throat> I grew up in that neighborhood. Uh, I never missed a meal. I had clothes, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I literally grew up in the street. You right, know, right. came home from school, get out there, go in the street. Yeah. And we made up our own games and so forth yeah. and so on. I bring that up. I bring that up, Teresa, because you know, to jump ahead from when I was an adult and I became a cop. Yeah. You know, I worked in the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the west side of 125th Street, and if I went to 125th Street and I looked three or four blocks over to the east, there was the Apollo Theater. Right. And then <clears throat> my first assignment as a cop was in the 25th Precinct, which was a very diverse precinct. Uh, <clears throat> the east side of the precinct, it was Italian, and they spoke Italian. In the middle of the precinct, it was Spanish. They spoke Spanish. Okay. And then we had uh, all the way over onto Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue. That was black. It was a very, very defined precinct yes. in terms of the people that resided there. Right. So, you know, you, were, you could be a policeman one way, you know, in, in this neighborhood, and four or five blocks over, mm -hmm. you were a different, a different, uh, a, a right. different policeman. Right. So... And uh, I saw, I saw immediately when I was there, I knew who was taking numbers. Mm -hmm. I knew who the bookmaker was. Right, you know, right. th 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 there was no fooling me. Right. <laughs> I was born, born and, you know, born and raised yeah. out in the streets I I yeah. in that environment. Well, I heard you played with someone in those streets uh, named George Collin. Is that true? Yeah, George, George Collin, you know, <laughs> to a degree, a lot of times was a thorn in my side. Was he? <laughs> yeah. But, he uh, liked to break them, right? Oh, George Collin was bright, <laughs> quick. Yeah. Uh, didn't have to do homework. Wow. Uh, yeah, George Collin, at 12 years of age, was the first one that uh, brought pot to us, you know. Uh, yeah, George, uh, George was a leader in a lot of things. He was, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so mean, he, he goes into comedy. And you, you actually um, joined the army, correct? Uh, I did. I. Um, <clears throat> Which thank you for your service, by the way. I, uh, you know, in my neighborhood there, being raised in the Second World War, mm -hmm. you know, in my in, in my neighborhood, it was basically everybody couldn't wait to get into the service, you know. Right. Uh, so, at 16, I started. You know, uh, for, you couldn't join the army without your parents' signature. Right. So at 16, I started, I started, I started, and my, and my dad, who was the most patient, loving, wonderful father that you could ever have, and his famous words were, what did your mother say? What is your mother going to do? <laughs> yeah. That was it. So I learned that my mother, so he said, he said to my, my mother one day, he said, Betty, you go ahead and sign, because I'm not going to sign. Okay. So that stopped me. From the mother, right. So uh, there was there was three or four of us, and I'll never, I'll call one guy's name. His name was Nicky Matsku. That we went down to Forty Second Street. Mm -hmm. Nicky Matsku was two months shy of being sixteen. I was two months shy of being seventeen. And we went down there and we gave the papers. And I always remember when he came to me, he said, "Well, what about your father?" And I said, "Oh, I, I lost my father. My father's dead." And he said, "Oh, I'm sorry." And he kept it up, and at 16, I went in. Wow. And Nicky Matsku, 
He went in at 15. Wow. Two months later, I got caught. They sent me back home. Uh-huh. In the meantime, I had signed up up there to become a paratrooper mm -hmm. because I understood that there was extra money in it. Right. So uh, he never got caught. I came home. And when I turned 17, uh, my father said, uh, would, you, would you stay home for Christmas? And then mm. you can go. Mm. And of course, I went uh, immediately after Christmas. The day that I went, uh, it was my mother's birthday. Oh, wow. So I left, yes, and yeah. I went into the service. I yeah. went over to Korea. Yes. Um, you know, and it was a war. And uh, Yeah, that was uh, the Battle of the Pork Chop Hill, and that was the Korean War. And you were actually decorated with three bronze stars and the Purple well, Heart. Yeah, I got uh, I got my third star. Uh, yeah, on uh, on Pork Chop Hill, and I have to say this, Teresa. There's a man sitting in the audience out here. Yes, his name is he Joe was, Cirillo. And he was with and you. That was called the Iron Triangle yeah, at that yeah. time, and it was uh, Baldy, Pork Chop, and Hill Five Nine Eight, and he was on Baldy. Yeah. And thank God they held Baldy, otherwise we would have really, really been yeah, out of luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I came home. And um, you came home and then you joined the police department? Well, there was no work. Yeah. There was absolutely no work for okay. us. The, the, you know, I believe the, the silhouettes were singing, get a job. <laughs> and this is also very important. I went in at 17 and it was Frank Sinatra, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, wow. uh, Harry James, uh, b uh, believe me. Uh, All the greats. And I came home. And it was four black guys uh, up on a stage virtually singing a cappella. Right. You know, and that's my music. Yeah, yeah. And that's my music. Yeah. Of course, it's, 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 it's come down to be rock and roll, <laughs> but it's the oldies. Uh, oh, that yeah. was my music. Oldies and goodies. So <clears throat> one day, Teresa, I was uh, playing stickball uh -huh. along with everybody else. Yeah. And we were uh, unemployed. And uh, Uncle Sam gave us $26 a week for, uh, for 26 weeks. Wow. And... Uh, Teresa, I, <clears throat> I was a wise guy. I, I never went to high school, not one day. Wow. So during that period, uh, I, I, I went back to school and I got a GED. And uh, 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 this guy came along with some uh, uh, job applications. And I'll never forget it. It was the police department, the fire department, the police department, and the Department of Parks. And I filled them all out. Wow. I never had an intention or a calling to be a cop. Really? Never. So what did you want as a kid? What did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, were you into sports? Were you into, what were you into? Is there something that you just said, oh, I want to do that when I get older? Mm. I was into, I was into taking illegal numbers. Okay. I was into <laughs> steering people to where the gambling dens were. Right. Which I was getting paid for. I'm sure very good money. I was really, I, I was really. You were a hustler. I, and believe me. You were a hustler. I, I was really, one of the proudest times back then, and I had a group of guys with me, is, is that <clears throat> I was going down to the store on 125th Street, and I was going to buy and pay for my own shoes. Four of us went down there, you know, to, to buy the, hey, Randy's going to buy his own shoes. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was really into. Yeah. And then when I came home, I guess to a degree, like a lot of guys, I was really lost. I was uh, 19. Yeah. I, 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 playing stickball. I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. But I went back to taking numbers. Uh -huh. I went back to, you know. It's what you knew. Yes, to, to doing that. By no means, Teresa, is this a felony crime that I'm committing, you know? Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> so, and of course, George Carlin is there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the police department was the first one to call. That's it. So when I went down there, yep, and the police academy at that time was only three months old. Now, I had an incident. Wow. I had an incident when yeah. I was home that uh, the sergeant who was investigating me called up. He said... We're wise to you, Jurgensen. We see that you've been arrested. You've been arrested here in, in, in a place of uh, bookmaking, a wire room and stuff like that. You've been, uh, you've been arrested twice. You, you think you're fooling us? And this is exactly what he said. You think you're a war hero and that's going to get over that? Wow. And I said, Sergeant, what do you mean I've been arrested? He says, well, you were arrested and gave the date. And I said, Sergeant, I was two years old. <laughs> It was my father. Oh. And my mother oh. got on the phone wow. and I said, that's the end of me being a cop. What my mother didn't say to this guy. <laughs> to 
this sergeant on the phone. Two weeks later, I got a letter. You've been accepted. <laughs> wow. And so I went down there. And after three months, I came out. I came out. Uh, I came out, Teresa, and I was met at my precinct with people that would be lifelong friends. Yeah. One of them I actually grew up with, but given that he's four or five years older than me, so when you're 13 and he's 18, you're not hanging out, and that's Sonny Grasso. Right. And Sonny Grasso was very instrumental, mm -hmm. which I will get into, yeah. in uh, why there is a French Connection movie. Yes. It's because of Sonny Grasso. Wow. So I'm working in that, pr I'm working in that precinct. I'm a rookie, and um, <clears throat> I... I commit my first times of uh, corruption. Uh, I'm working there, and I'm working in the Italian section. Uh -huh. I'm there two or three weeks, and you could use discretion. You could use discretion then. I, I learned that people could not afford a $15 double parking summons. Mm -hmm. I, I learned this on my own. Right. And so, but there was, you could give a summons for wheels not to the curb, which was only $5. Okay. And Teresa, remember, I'm talking back in the 50s. Yeah. So you can imagine what $15 would Compared be today. To today. So sure. I gave them that summons, you know. So, so uh, like I say, I'm working then that. And one day, the barber comes out, and he pulls me, pulls me aside, and uh, pulls me into the shop. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a brand new cop for yeah, two, three yeah. months there. Yeah, you're a rookie. And he's taking my jacket off, sitting me in the chair, and he's got the scissors, and I'm saying, well, no, 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 bop, 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 <laughs> and, I, and I get a haircut. And, of course, I go in my pocket, and he steps back like, like I'm pulling a gun on yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost an insult to yeah, offer him money. Yeah, That's corruption. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of weeks later, I'm walking down. Out comes the tailor. And the tailor comes out. <laughs> he takes me into the tailor shop. Take your pants off. <laughs> you know, take your jacket. And he's pressing my pants and oh. my jacket. I don't even offer him money by now. I know it. <laughs> out the door I go. But here's, here's what it was meant being a cop back in those days, yeah. Teresa. There was a drugstore. And obviously there are drugs in the drugstore. Yes. His name was Dave. He was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking one day. And it's like a 4 to 12, and he's closing up at 6 o'clock. And he said, officer, and he called me, oh, cop, come on in. He says, I know, he says, and it's rain and it's cold and it's 12 o'clock at night and 2 o'clock in the morning. He says, and you don't have any place to go and use a bathroom. He says, here's the key. Wow. The druggist gives me the key to his store. And, of course, 12 o'clock, I go in, I find a hot plate in there. Uh, you know, you put the you could put the coffee yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. The cash register's open with money in it, wow. and as wide as this over, over here yeah. on the glass is every kind of drug there uh, there was. Yeah. This is the the trust, respect, whatever you want to say yeah. that they that, had yeah. for a cop that I wasn't going to steal anything or do anything. Wow. That that never left me. It's amazing. It really, really never left me. It's amazing. So, I worked and you, at, you 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 became a detective. Right, fairly right well, away. Well, a uh, <clears throat> couple of people that I met, a couple of people that I met there, one was uh, Nick Cirillo, mm -hmm. who came on the job with Joe Cirillo. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I, he, he was a detective there, and I met, uh, I met a couple of cops. I met a couple of cops, Sonny Israel and Tony Altamari, and when I was in the police academy, I was in the police academy on 125th Street, uh, and I was taking numbers, and they caught me and put me up against the wall and stuff. And I said, geez, guys, you know, I'm in the police academy. And they said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, what the hell are you doing? What are you, crazy? And they're in that precinct. Right. So I get to that precinct. I got a bit of a reputation, you know. <laughs> One last story I'll tell you before I become a detective. Um, I was walking, yeah. walking down there, and there was this group of guys, you know, and uh, they were on one side of Second Avenue, you know, sitting on the chair the wrong way outside of a social club. Yeah. And it was, hey, rookie, hey, hey don't shoot yourself. And, uh, you know, it, it just kept it up. And yeah. so finally one day I just walked over to him and I said, you got a problem with me? And he says, yeah, I got a problem with you. Uh -oh. And I says, well, we can settle that problem. He says, yeah, but you got a gun. I said, I'll meet you down here after 4 o'clock, which I did. And it was a group of guys that came with me. Sonny Grasso came and so forth. 
And I went into the backyard, and when we went into the backyard, and I said, you got a problem with me? And he said, yes, I got a problem with you. Teresa, I hauled off. I broke his nose. Down he went. And I said, I hope you don't have a problem with me anymore. anymore. And I came back out. The next day I came, and the captain called me in. Oh, no. And the captain says to me, Jurgensen, he says, we don't do things like that. <laughs> we don't do things like that, he says. And I said, I'm sorry. It'll never happen again. And he says, all right, get out of my office. And he said, Jurgensen, good work. <laughs> so so oh now I'm riding in a radio car and we get a gun run. Yeah. This is how I became a detective. Yes. We, there's a gun run. And there's a, a, a detective's car that was right alongside of me. And Nick Cirillo's in that car. And we go up the stairs as fast as we can. We break the door down. The guy's got a rifle and he's firing into a courtyard. And, you know, whether there were the children in there or not, I don't know. Yeah. He was firing into the courtyard, and we broke the door down, and Nick and I both wrestled him to the ground, and we made the newspaper. <laughs> we got into the newspaper, wow. and the front page on the newspaper. So I went to court with him, and while I'm in court, this uh, captain came over to me in civilian clothes. How old are you? Where do you work? Are you shaving yet? Blah, 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 so forth and so on. And he said, uh, I want you tomorrow to report to the first precinct. You report to the first precinct, okay. which is today's museum. Right. So, Teresa, I went, went to, to the precinct the next day, put on my uniform. I went down there, and I was interviewed by a lieutenant mm -hmm. to be an undercover narcotic cop. And that lieutenant is Mario Biaggi, who would later on become a congressman. Mm -hmm. So... I, I went through the same questions and so forth and so on. And he said to me, he, he went like this, and by now it was like Jurgensen. Jurgensen, go up to the precinct, get out of that bag, the bag is the uniform, <laughs> yes. and come back here. Right. And so I came back there, and um, within a week or two, I was out uh, buying narcotics in Alphabet City yeah. and throughout the city. Yeah. I didn't have a problem. I, I did not have a problem uh, buying, buying narcotics. Right. I mean, how scary was it to go into these drug dens, I mean, undercover and, you know, make a bust or, you know, do what you need to do while you're in there? You know, were you alone? Did you have anything one with you? No, you're alone. You're alone. So, you're I mean, that, it's kind of like scary uh, there. And, and the problem Andy. is, Teresa, the way that it works, and honestly, the short version, is you get a drug addict in the street. Now, you're dealing with a desperate person. Yes, here. very. You're going to take his drugs away. This man is desperate. Yes. So I, I, I got a hold of him, and, you know, it was almost a nothing bust, and I said to him, look, <clears throat> you're not working for me. I said, you won't be on these streets. I, 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 I just, it, it just flowed. I spoke his language. Right. I, and I said to him, you're taking me tomorrow. You're taking me, and you better be here. You're taking me tomorrow to where you're buying drugs and I'm going to buy drugs. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, virtually, you have now put your life in the hands of a very desperate, desperate. person. Yes. And so I met him. We went up there. And he knocked on the door, blah, blah, blah. I'm, you know, I know this guy. You know their language. Yeah, I, I'm not yeah. going to say that. No, we can't curse on the show. No, I'm not going to do it's that. It's going to cable. And so, <laughs> yep, and I, I put up my money. I was excited. I was excited and stuff like that. Yeah. I bought the drugs. He went his way. I went my way. And the backup, the backup is yes. one or two blocks away. Yeah. I came back out, and I was elated. I was walking on water, you know? Wow. Teresa, when you, when you do that for 14 and 15 months, which I did, I almost forgot that I was a cop. Yeah. They say and when you go undercover for a very long time, you, know, you kind of lose yourself. Yeah. It, it kind of happens. You know, right? so <clears throat> I was doing that. Now, <clears throat> how I be, now, I'm undercover and I'm a white shield cop. Okay. I'm a white shield cop, although that's a detective's unit. Right. Now, very important here, Teresa, is that Sonny Grasso and Eddie Egan and Dick Oletta, they're working in an outfit called SIU. That's like a special investigative unit. Right. Then I am out in the street buying $75 half loads. Half of it was talcum powder. Right. But they're working on keys, right. which were worth $32,000 at the time. Yeah. And they're working this case. They're working. Every now and then they pulled me over, 
you know, to babysit a witness or to sit on a wiretap or to follow somebody. I was not in the inner circle for that. Right. And so this happened almost simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> I go into Alphabet City and I make my, and I make my buy uh, up on the fifth floor. And I'm coming down and I see hands and sneakers coming up. And I know I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'm in trouble. So I run up, I get on the roof, and they're following me. I run on the roof, jump over the roof a couple, three times. I get the fire escape, I run down, and I come out on Delancey Street. Now I know I've either lost them or they're not going to take me off with the crowd. Right. Remember we talked about earlier a cop's gut that yes. knows that something... Yes. When I came out on Delancey Street, I knew something was not right. The big restaurant there is Ratner's. And Ratner's had a small black and white TV in it, right? Mm -hmm. And the people were grouped there. And I saw the people sort of wandering or whatever it was. So I made my way over into the 7th precinct. And there's a sergeant behind the desk. And now we do the dance. And the dance is not everybody back then looked like Eddie Egan. Right. They looked like Randy Jurgensen. Long hair, not right. shaving, right. nose blown over himself, a yeah. drug addict. Yeah. So I give him a few, nomen you know, you have 61, that's a crime. Right. You have right. 28 right. means a day off. Right. Okay. So then I give him the drugs. And I, he's turning to go to put the drugs in the safe. Yeah. And I said, hey, Sarge, what's wrong? And he said to me, where the F have you been? They just shot and killed the President of the United States. Wow. My world stopped. It just stopped. I believe the whole world stopped. Yes. It just stopped right yeah. there. So I went down to narcotics, full grown men, grown men, uh, Second World War, veterans, right, bawling, yep. crying, mm -hmm. standing around. I never knew what happened to that arrest. Mm -hmm. And that went on for about one or two, one or two weeks. But... They made that case, and that case, it's been surpassed by quantity, but never quality. It was like 90% pure, Wow! and so that got into the paper, and uh, that attracted a writer by the name of Robin Moore, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called The Green Berets. Right. So he came down to narcotics. He got permission to work with us. Right. I virtually never did. Mm -hmm. uh, and he worked with Sonny and Eddie. And he wrote a book called The French Connection. Right. And The French Connection would inevitably turn into the movie The French Connection movie. Right. So at that same time, now, after those two, three weeks have gone by, I get called to the district attorney's office. Yes. And it's in Najari is the district attorney. And th this was quite long that we went through, so I'll be short. And they said, you're going into, and they called it the gay world. You're going to be working uh, with homosexuals. Right. Here's what's happening. Homosexuals are being cornered, coerced, and shook and down. Right. Shook down, yes. you know. They're going to lose their job. Right. They're getting them in compromising situations and so forth and so on. And so that's, what, that's the world that you're going to go into. It's much more than that, they yeah. told me. Yeah. So uh, they gave me an apartment on uh, Ble Bleecker Street. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this Teresa would go on for another six months. Wow. So over there on Bleecker Street, you know, I'm ingratiating himself into, I'm going to call it, the gay world at right, that particular right. time. Mm -hmm. I met a guy down the hall. He, uh, we used to go to breakfast together. And no, Teresa, I, I didn't live in that apartment. Of course not. I showed up now and then. I worked nights and right, whatever it was. Right. And then I went off, you know, into, into uh, 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 the life that I was yeah, supposed to be yeah, in. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so while I'm working down there, now I get the word and I have these meetings. Uh, I have these meetings with these captains. And remind me to tell you about the movie. The, about, about, about these the captains yeah. here. And, um, um, and they said, we now have three or four homosexuals or gay people that not only have they been killed, but they've been chopped up. Right. And so now, not only, now I'm working on killers. Right. And from get-go, they suspected that these two, two men. were cops. Right. And one was black, one was white, right. and they were nicknamed the Salt and Pepper Team. Right. So now I'm working on what I'm calling cop killers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So 
There can't be anything more important than that. And I get called over to the district attorney's office. And uh, it's Najari again. And uh, Greenwich Village has made a complaint that there's a lewd and indecent act going on in this place called... Comedian. A comedian you're talking about. Yeah, uh, go, go. A lewd and indecent act. Yes. And you had to you had to arrest this man. Yeah, right? They put the wire on they me. I didn't yep. want a wire. Yep, went over wired. there. We wired him up. up, up, yeah. up. But again, long story short, right. it, this took three weeks. Imagine I'm working on a comedian right. while there's two people out killing, killing people. people. Yes. But that's what I did. Right. And so I got him. And of course, it's Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce, people. I locked up Lenny Bruce. Locked up Lenny Bruce. Jo and George Collins. George Collins announced that at one of the shows. Didn't never he? forgave didn't him he, for it. Didn't he introduce right. you and say that you locked him up? So then after, <laughs> after that, after I did that, I went back. And uh, <laughs> good police work yes. and a lot of luck. Yes. I got the two guys. But we never got them for the murder. But I, but I got them. They got seven years apiece. Okay. And I got a gold shield. Right. Wow. Teresa, <clears throat> I get assigned to the 26th precinct. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, and that was the 26th precinct, I was delivering groceries. And the groceries had beer and cigarettes. Right. And there were two cops mm -hmm. that would stop me, mm -hmm. and they would take the beer, they would take the cigarettes. Th that's what they would do. And there was some name calling. Okay. Racial name calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we know you, Super's kid, blah, 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 so forth and so on. I went back to the store and I told him. And he made believe like it never happened. I went to my father and my father said, keep your mouth shut. Mm. So I did. All right? So I put up with that for about a year. Wow. Well, Teresa, I go into the 26th precinct. <laughs> I got this brand new shield. Okay. And there's the two of them. <gasps> Once again, you know, Randy. <laughs> so uh, the fight broke out, right? Wow. And so the initial report was I was under arrest. I was under arrest in the precinct, uh -huh. you know? And I just sort of sat there and I said to myself, it's worth it, you know? And the two of them, you know, <laughs> half in the bag, you know? Uh, I gave it to them good. So. <laughs> So I'm under oh arrest. So, so now they hear the story. Oh. The captain comes down and so forth and so on. Yeah. And I told them really what happened. And this one detective, Graham, said, keep your mouth shut. You're going to be okay here. Yeah. This never happened. Okay. Don't talk about it. <laughs> Don't do anything like that. And I said, yes. And as far as I know, I'm the only detective, only detective that was transferred without orders. I was transferred on a teletype. And they sent me to the 2-8 precinct uh -huh. and anybody can tell you the 28 precinct is it's the it's it's first in, it's first in anything it's the top on being the toilet okay that's everything that's under it Got dear it. god almighty first in everything wow. first in cop killings first in everything wow. so i would wound up doing i would wound up doing uh 17 17 years mm -hmm. uh in in the 28 precinct however what I just told you about locking those people up, right. locking those, the salt and pepper team yeah. up, <clears throat> in 1979, which I had done four or five pictures with Billy Freakin, right. he said to me, Randy, I have optioned a book called Cruising, right. but only for the title, and you and I are going to sit together, which we did for weeks. Right. And we, he wrote Cruising. Yes. So out of those two, out of those two, things that I was Colors. really yeah. inverted, yeah, yeah, yeah. came the French Connection wow. and came cruising. Amazing, amazing. Well, you know what? We have to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to hear more about it with Randy. Don't go away. Back after these messages. Wonder Woman was everything to little girls, especially that look like me. She stands for being a voice for people that need a voice. My organization renovates homes for people with disabilities. And when I come home, a self-care routine makes me feel my best. I'm very proud of the difference that we're making. And to see that impact in my community inspires me to work even harder for everyone around me. All right. 
is everybody having a good time tonight or what? That's what I thought. Hi, I'm Georgia Rose, founder of Zencuda. You can watch me on the Soul Space podcast every Friday at noon on Channel 20 for spiritual guidance. And as you all know, um, that is how I first opened into my own psychic gifts was through the angelic realm, astrology. So we've got Mars and the Sun together in Scorpio, which creates a lot of combustion in the astrological world. We call that a Kazimi and tarot. When the Four of Cups right side up, it means we have a lot of choices to make and we're not looking at what's really being divinely given to us. We're too busy in the busyness of the choices to really see the divine intervention, the divine timing, and the divine guidance. We're the place. Watch the Soul Space Podcast. There's no, there's no way. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tea Time. <laughs> so great you're joining me. I am with a friend of mine. Met him a while ago. Read his book. It's amazing. I'm going to talk about that. Randy Jurgensen is here. He's an actor, producer, author, um, also retired uh, policeman. Um, I, I, an amazing, amazing career. Um, just so much to get to, and I want to get it all in. Uh, we talked um, earlier. Well, I just want to give some sh quick, quick shout outs. Hello. To Sal Grasso, Paul's watching, Bruno, Michael, and Greg. Thank you, everyone. Share this um, and watch it, watch it, watch it. And also, we're going to get to his book. But in the meantime, um, uh, two collars that you made, two arrests that you made, went to two, went into making of two huge movies. One was The French Connection, which you mentioned before. We have a couple of pics with that. There you are. There's, there's Gene Hackman. Um, with that pick. And the next pick, what's that from? Because I wasn't too sure what the second one was pick. Is that this, from that's the same, it, that, same French movie? French, French Connection. Connection. Okay. And then also you did mention, which I have, wait, I have this. We're going to put this up. Right. I think it, that's The Godfather because after the French Connection, hold on. After the French Connection. Am I having, pulling the right one, right? It's French Connection. Yes. The, after the French Connection, which was done in 1971, then in 1972, <laughs> came along Godfather. the Godfather. So obviously what you did was you became a, t a major technical advisor for film and television and you you really were actor. an an actor because yeah. you 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 I, I you, did screen actor Yeah, you, from, you did. From, from uh, from the French Connection. You did. And then you did you, so you did French Connection, you did The Godfather. You have over 30 credits on IMDb. You also also produced and associate produced and tech advisor. You had your hands in a lot of, uh, you know, bags, so to speak. Um, you did um, Seven Up with Roy Schne Schneider. Schne Schneider. I never say his name right. Which you play a detective. That's written by Sonny Grasso. Yeah, but you also did two of the movies with him as well. A yeah. lot of people you worked with. Yeah. You know, you you worked with it more than once. Right. You did um, the Sorcerer. Um, and and the, and 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 if I'm right, the seven the seven ups, which you did. Well, the you, person that I really worked with throughout all those movies right. is the director, Billy Freakin. Right. So, so really, that's important really, really, to mention. And uh, you also did that I've lost. Contract on Cherry Street with Frank Sinatra. I was. Hello. Oh boy. That's like a pinch me moment. Oh, that was a, <laughs> that was a blast. How crazy was that? And then you did um, Blood Brothers with Richard Gia and Paul Sorvino. Uh, Richard, you, 
Yeah. Amazing, amazing. You did um, The Brinks Job with Peter Falk and Peter Boyle. You did Superman with Christopher Reeve. Yes. You did one of my favorites, Fort Apache the Bronx. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Danny with, Aiello. With Danny and Paul Newman and oh. Asner, Ken Wall. You did uh, The Vigilante with Robert Forster. You also was um, uh, um, uh, a uh, associate producer on that as well. On which one? On The uh, Vigilante. Vigilante. Yes. You did Still of the Night, again with Roy. Meryl Streep, Jessica Tandy. Maniac. M Maniac. You did Still of the Night. Uh, you did Jura with Demi Moore yeah. and uh, Alec Baldwin. Okay? You did Thinner. Well, that was a Stephen King film, and you produced it. Yes. Okay? On and on and on, people. Donnie Brasco, one of my faves with Al Pacino, Johnny right. Depp, Michael Madsen, who I had the pleasure of interviewing. Um, 1995, now we're going into Die Hard, uh, Die Hard uh, Revenge with uh, Bruce Willis, Samuel Jackson, and you were a tech advisor on that. Yes. Uh, I, this is yes. not a, just, a, this is not a list of just stars. Hello? This is like a game here. I mean, I, I was I was I was jogging with Burt Reynolds when Screen <laughs> Actors Guild went on strike, and Burt Reynolds said, "See ya." <laughs> he, he, he went back to California. <laughs> Did yeah. he really? Yeah. I mean, and, and the, I mean, the list goes on and on. And again, you also produced. You produced Goost with um, Jennifer Tilly, associate producer. You did New York Cop with Mira Sorvino, co-producer. Um, in the Shadow of a Killer, Scott Bakula. And um, again, executive producer, a time to remember. Um, and, and in these movies, hello, you were also in them. You played detectives. You played, you've played a plethora of, 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 you also played bad guys too. Yeah, did. did you like playing the bad guys, Randy? <laughs> Come on, tell me the truth. <laughs> did you like putting on that hat? <laughs> There's not a heck of a lot of difference from a, from a cop and a bad guy up, up on certain it's levels. It's just the clothing. <laughs> it's the clothing that's different. <laughs> And the pinky ring. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I mean, it's 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 amazing. It's just amazing what you've done and how you know just to again to to arrests lead to to major again cruising with Pacino and and and, and Gene Hackman and the French Connection. I mean, Shadow of a Killer. Uh, Shadow of a Killer is yes. is, is is about a, a detective. Who's against the uh, against capital punishment, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I I have always always been in. I, I was mocked by a picture called the Oxbow Incident yes. of Dana Andrews yes. and uh, Henry Fonda, mm -hmm. and so I had actually uh, done a commercial uh, against the uh, against capital against capital punishment, yeah. and I was out one night with my sister and my brother-in-law, and got involved and so forth and so on and the, the two 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 soldiers yeah not soldiers in the army soldiers, no, soldiers. from the boys in Brooklyn yes uh, they off the cop he actually practically died died in front of me wow. and uh, you know after a struggle and a shot and so forth I, I got both of them and uh, John Keenan uh, when we were in the precinct John Keenan said and this is his exact words uh, John Cannon said, well, <clears throat> the cop is white, the two people that have killed the cop is white, the detective that has arrested them is white, we're going for the electric chair. And I had already made a commercial that I was against the electric chair. Wow. So that got to be pretty hairy mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. And of course, out of that came the $50,000 that was placed on my uh, pl placed on my head yeah what but what, what but but that's what that movie's about shadow of a killer wow it's about it's about a, scott bacula playing me right uh which after dailies Teresa, he came to me one day did you see the dailies and i said yeah he said do you like them i said yeah he said did you notice anything i said no he said randy i'm playing it left-handed you're left-handed <gasps> <laughs> Look at that! That's what actors do. Wow! That's what they do. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But but so that was the, um, the the bounty on your head. This was this was an undercover investigation again. Members of the Black Liberation Army. Well, right? that's a different one. That's a different story. That's a different. So, th one. so wait before we get to that. Wait before we get to that. There's just so much to get to. I just wanted to back up a second and and mention also 1987. You did Heat with Steve Buscemi. Um, and you produced that and you wrote it. 
Heart. Correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Heart. heart. I didn't say it. Steve heart, Buscemi not Steve. And, heart. And, and, sorry, uh, Heart. And, uh, and you wrote it. And you I did. produced I, J it. James Lemon and I wrote that. Yes. We wrote that. Uh, yeah, that was... I originally wrote yeah, did someone it. For, approach I originally you wrote it for uh, Treat Williams. Yes. As a oh, middleweight, Treat Williams wasn't available, oh. so we got Brad Davis. Okay. And um, he, uh, Brad Davis was w was losing his life at the time. I, I, we never knew it. Wow. We never knew it. it, it wow. He, he he passed on of AIDS. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, we 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 wrote Heart. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I put it yeah. does say Heart. I misread it. Sorry. That's so, Steve Buscemi's first acting. Very first film. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay, so I want to get to this undercover investigation that you were doing, um, the Black Liberation Army, and at one point they had placed a bounty on your head. Very scary thing, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure it was, but what happened with that? What was, the, was that, well, was that before <clears throat> the 19th? Again, uh, again, um, in 1971. Yes. I, I, just, I just came off the trial of convicting the two of them, and the federal government struck down uh, capital punishment as unconstitutional, yeah. and so they got 25 to life. Uh, they served uh, 40 years. One died in prison, wow. and one, uh, 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 one is out. Yeah. But as soon as that was over, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Black Liberation Army, with no social redeeming value whatsoever on any level, right? Uh, they. And, and these are the terms that I've always used. They executed Piagentini and Jones. And Teresa, 13 cops would be set up and killed. And those 13 cops, they were Irish, Italian, Spanish, black, white, sergeant, cop. They were killing cops. Right. No matter what your color was, your yeah, ethnic matter. group, they were killing cops. Yeah. That was their mission. Right. So, they, uh, I, I was working that night, and uh, I, I got a call, and I went to uh, Harlem Hospital, and Piagentini and Jones were there. Jones was still on the operating table. Piagentini was downstairs in the morgue, and uh, I undressed Piagentini. I saw in his hat his uh, three kids, and... The toughest thing I had to do, Teresa, was take off his wedding band. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, then later on met his wife. Mm -hmm. And um, we, rem we remained friends. I attended the, the children's high school graduations and stuff. And, uh, and we just lost her mm -hmm. about three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, then Seedman uh, put together a group. And it was headed up by Nick Cirillo. Mm -hmm. And he put together a group. And I drew Piagentini. Uh, Butler drew, uh, uh, but but Butler drew uh, Jones. And off went the investigation. And I'll never forget it, what Seedman, uh, Seedman said, said to us. And there were seven of us. And Seedman said to us, and don't and effing come home until you get them. Wow. Well, my wife is sitting out there, and yeah. she will tell you, yeah. uh, I mean, sometimes there was four and five days that I, I, I just never came home because right, right. I was in St. Louis, I was here, yeah. and so forth and so on. And, yes, that was the start of the, uh, of the killings of the Black Liberation Army. Right. Now, that happened in 1971. Right. And then, again, uh, 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 while, while that's going on, I'm working the motion picture the French Connection. Yes, yes. I was in the East Coast Stuntman's Association, yes. so I wound up doing a lot of driving in yeah, the French yeah, Connection. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing that, I'm doing the French Connection, mm -hmm. and my wife will tell you I'm never home. Well, I have to tell you also what I left out was when he did The Godfather, he was one of the guys that shot Sonny yes. at the toll booth. Yes. There, where was that film? Tell everyone where that was yeah, filmed. Yeah, outside of uh, Nassau Community College, uh, Coppola came to us and said that, uh, I understand you guys are, were paratroopers. I said, yeah. And he said, paratroopers have machine guns. And I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got it. Uh, 
that took about three days. There was quite a, quite a yeah, difficult yeah, yeah. scene I to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it was a long just, shoot. Just the shooting. Never yes, mind. Yeah. Never mind Jimmy Kahn. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, just the shooting. The the guns weren't simultaneously working. The mm -hmm. candy glass wasn't breaking. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, Coppola came and he said, "Look, Randy." Stop holding the gun in your left hand because the camera's on the right. <laughs> Put it on your hand, and if the gun doesn't go off, poke it through the glass and go rat tat tat. Uh, and we did. Wow. And they had the shot. And yeah. I went over and I kicked Jimmy Kahn, and at the end of the scene, Capola Yeah, I know came, you kicked him. <laughs> yeah, Capola came over to me and he said, You know, you're going to be the most hated man in America. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why? And he says, there you're is not a female, there's not a female that's Kitty, not I was in love you too. with Sonny Corleone. <laughs> he says, and you killed him. Oh, Teresa, for the God. longest of times, so I would get emails to the man who shot Sonny Corleone. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I was known as, the guy who shot wow. Sonny Corleone. If it wasn't hard enough that George Carlin was telling people I locked up Lenny Bruce, yeah, right? everybody was saying that I shot Sonny Corleone. Well, yeah. listen, I have to, you know, my show goes so fast, but I, we have to talk about your book. This is an amazing book, people. It's called Circle of Six, the true story of New, York, New York's most notorious cop killer and the cop who risked everything to catch him. Um, an amazing, amazing read. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, Joe Pistone wrote, Jurgensen is the genuine article. He stands among some of the best detectives in the NYPD. The Mosque case of 1972 is the most famous case amongst the rank and file of NYPD and the circle of six no holes barred. Uh, this is an incredible read. I was getting so ticked off reading this that I had to keep putting it down and coming back to it and putting it down and coming back to it. Your life changed on April 14th, 1972. I did. And um, this book incorporates everything that you went through from landing in the hospital um, to coming out of the hospital to making a promise to yourself um, to catch the killer of Philip Cardillo, who was killed, unfortunately, that day. Um, a lot of people were too young to remember, maybe, and we only have a few minutes left, but I just want you to um, tell me how cathartic and hard this was to write and how now you like to make it into a motion picture and who is doing that screenplay right now for you. Well, the, 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 thing, about, the thing about that is that there were other books and other articles and uh, the, all of the books in the uh, Sel Sel Selwyn Rabb from the New York Times really wrote. Uh, it get, got into People magazine, uh, but they all, all of them said they did this, they did that. So I was determined that I was not going to write a book that they did this, they did that. Right. And so it took some digging and it took some homework and stuff like that. And so I named I named the people you know, that I felt was most responsible, mm -hmm. most responsible uh, for what happened that day. And the, the one thing that I would like to say upon people is that during that time, 13 cops were set up and executed, and it was all, all boots on the ground. It was go get them. Nothing was spared to go get them. On this case here, Yeah, very nothing. different. Very, very different. No, nothing. In fact, they got in the way. They, you know, they stood in the way. A lot of corruption. It's a, it's a great embarrassment. Yep. Yeah, you know? it was horrific. But yes, the book right now, there is a man by the name of uh, Bill Teitler, a well, well-known uh, producer of Hurricane and with, Jumanji. With uh, Denzel Washington. Denzel yes. Washington mm -hmm. with uh, uh, all the Jumanji movies, and he is actually, uh, he's actually writing the screenplay. Wow, amazing. He's writing the screenplay. It's not being adapted from the book. Right. No, it has nothing to do with the book. Okay. He is, he, 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 he is writing, he's presently writing the screenplay. Mm -hmm. So this time, Teresa, we all got our fingers crossed. We'll hope that I it, do too, it, because makes, it's, it makes it a big, it's, to the big it's, an, it's an amazing story. It really is. It should have never happened. Thank you. And, and, and I just want to thank you again for your service in the service, at home, uh, you know, you've had an incredible, you, you have, Randy, you have to come back because I only did a part two with Joe Cirillo, but I'm gonna do part two with you. 
You have so many stories to tell. I'm no so problem. sorry I can't get to all of them, but I wanted to get to you know the the main ones we wanted to talk about. You know, and, and, and Teresa, I gave a shout out to a lot of people. Yes. All while I went through that, yes. all of those years I went through that, yeah. you know, I had a wife. Yes, Lynn. Shout out I, to Lynn, I, I, uh, I, who I, was by your side, thick and thin, and through the caca. And trust the, me. The good times and bad times, and, you know, a, and me. she's a saint as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And she's Italian. You found a good woman. Of course she's Italian. Come on. Are you kidding? Um, thank you. Thank you again for You're being welcome. here. Thank You're you. Welcome. I really, really do appreciate welcome, it. Tracy. I really do. I want to thank everyone for watching. I, I want to just um, say, um, uh, Carmine, if you could put up that pic, please, of my aunt. I'm dedicating the show to my Aunt Millie, who passed away. Um, aunt Millie Montori, rest in peace. I love you. Thank you, Carmine, for that. Again, thank you, Randy, for this. You, my door is open. You come back anytime you want because... We have to do a part two with you. Come back we, with Joe Cirillo. We really do. Oh, wow. What a tag team that's going to be. All right. Listen, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting Tea Time. I really appreciate it. Remember, tell everyone you love you love them. And I'll see you next week. Ciao. Say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.